There's a hike tomorrow. Uh, Sue is, uh, Myers is organizing it. East Applegate Ridge Trail. Where's your meeting place? Here, you'll be here at, at 9 o'clock. Pretty flat trail you have here. Um, and uh, different distances, you go there and back. You can go as far as you want and turn around and come back. So you raise your hands so everyone can see you. Thank you for doing that. And then um, stopping on the Pony Express afterward. Alright, so I'll see you soon. Have something interesting. The Methodist Men's um, Dinner is um, January 25th, two weeks, two weeks. At 6 p.m., check out your bulletin. There's a sign up in the back. The director of the World Retreat will be speaking, so we'll close the board. Potluck after worship. Wow. We're going to have a small potluck. <laughs> oh my God, where is it? Maybe we were going to dry it out from yesterday. Are there any other announcements for the good community? Let's center ourselves for worship. Thank you.
peace with one another, especially at send a hand to someone you don't know or haven't, haven't seen in a while. There are a few new neighbors. Are there others? Okay, let's, um, 
Our response is, uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear us and help us. And if we could go to the song we're going to sing. We're going to sing ourselves. I believe it's uh, to know you more. <coughs> you might have to back up there. Thank you. <coughs> Let us join in singing.
for long animosities and hatreds. For the people of the Middle East, for both Palestinian and Jew, for the people of Ukraine, and yes, for the people they fight against. For all in this world who struggle for self-determination. Lord, your mercy, hear us and help us. For those who have lost family, homes, and livelihood to conflict. For the leaders of the nations, that they might see the light of reconciliation and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear us and help us. We, feel, we pray for those who feel lost without purpose, who struggle with depression and darkness, those who search for their vocation. We remember the unemployed and those without shelter, those that are on our streets. We pray for those who struggle with mental illness, especially those who keep it hidden. Deepen our compassion and understanding. Give us patience with the persistent struggles that we face in our homes, in our communities, and family life. Lord, in your mercy, hear us yes. and help us. We pray for the mission of this church and this congregation. Give us courage, give us stamina, give us laughter, and always give us hope. Teach us how to love like you did in this world, to love as you love the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear yes. us and help us. We pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. It's up on our screen. Our greater in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us bread for our needs from day to day, and forgive us our offenses as we have forgiven our offenders. And do not let us enter into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> can we sign up on Breeze now for our giving? Yes. We can. It's so, like all right. Up on the Great. So our new system is live. As I've been saying, it was less expensive, easier to use. I want to thank my sister for helping us out with that, and who was uh, our robot master. Um, I figure I'm going to get her involved in church one way. I've been working on her. She's very close to me for years at the church. So she's now um, kind of attending our church online. So I'm, I'm just taking it where I can get it. And she has just watched me later this afternoon saying this. Who should give me a call? <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, bless these gifts, bless our efforts in this coming year. Amen. Thank you. And uh, thanks for the music, guys.
but they have no root and endure only for a while. Then when trouble and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word. But the cares of the word, world and the lure of the wealth and the desire of other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30 and 60 and 100 fold. Word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There are some really difficult things in the Gospel of Mark that um, I don't understand. But in Lent, we're going to look at some of these really difficult passages, like what Kathy read, really tough stuff. You are the seed. I don't think anyone knows this. It's actually a Spanish hymn. Uh, you want to play it for once? We can hear it. Actually, why don't you sing the first verse? Play it through, and then we'll join you on the second, third, and fourth. That way we can hear it, right? Get a sound for it. And if you want it, it helps look at the notes. You can open your hymnal 583. Thanks, guys.
farmer went out to scatter his seed. Let us pray. May I do no great harm this day, O Lord, for some small good. Recently, I, I had um, an all too common conversation about spirituality versus religion. I was introduced um, to someone as a Methodist pastor in Medford, and that person responded by saying, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I hear that a lot. And I'm not, I'm not really sure why people give me this unsolicited um, information when they meet me. Except that, um, you know, I know that it relates to my profession, if you can call it that, or my calling. I, 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 I haven't really thought about this. I suppose it would be like if um, someone introduced me to a person who sold life insurance, and I responded by saying, well, I already have life insurance. In other words, um, you know, please um, save your spiel for someone else. I, I'm not interested. So maybe that's why folks do that, to kind of on guard. But by not being religious, I'm assuming um, this person meant he doesn't have much use for organized religion. I, I, I think that's what's going on there. Um, he's not part of a church or a synagogue. In, in, in American society, um, people say that to me like, like that, that makes them different, but, but actually it doesn't. That's actually now in American society, the majority. But folks um, committed you know, to a religious Institution, you know, that, that's, that's become a smaller number. By spiritual, I assume he meant he believed in the unseen, like he, he believes in the human soul and a divine presence in the world. I, I think that's what that means. But I'm, somewhat, I'm veering off my point. I, so I've been thinking about that statement. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And I would say about myself, I'm not necessarily spiritual, but I am religious. And I think that's true. I think that's really true about me. Or I'm not always spiritual, but I'm religious. And, and I realize that in our time, that's a, a kind of odd thing to say, a really odd thing for a minister to say. So I want to explain myself. There are days when I don't feel close to God. That's part of being human, folks, even if you're ordained. And I, I need the institution, despite all its faults, and its mistakes, its own sins, I need the practices of a church to carry me through. I can't do it on my own. I, I actually need that institution that people say they don't want so many. And I need the things that come with it. I need a church family. And, and sometimes I just need a sanctuary to go to, like this place. I need the devotional life that the church has taught me, right? I need that. I, I need rituals. I need the ritual of worship, like what we're doing here. I need the rituals, and rituals isn't a bad word. I need the rituals of Holy Communion. I, I, I need the liturgy that it has. I need to sing spiritual songs and hymns from time to time with others who believe in those lyrics too. I need, I need those melodies that have been embedded in my life, like Come Thou Fond for Every Blessing or Be Thou My Vision, those, those kind of songs. You see, I, I, I have no problem with the church or with religion being a crutch. I, I don't know why that's a negative statement. I don't find that derogatory. Anyone who tells you that they're standing on their own two feet really hasn't thought that statement through. Example, a metaphor. I have a butterfly bush in my back yard that needs a crutch. It fall, was falling over and its thin branches and leaves were on the ground. So I hammered a wooden stake near the center of that plant and I tied, I tied the stake to the trunk of this butterfly bush. And now the bush 
is, is this flag standing tall. That's why I need religion and the church. It's been the stake that's driven through the center of my life. And it holds me up. And I know it's a human institution and churches really can really mess up. But I'm not ready to toss it. I need it. In difficult times, we lean on healthy things like family, whether that family is given or chosen. We lean on that morning, that morning walk we've taken for the last 20 years. And we lean on not so healthy things like drinking too much or going back to unhealthy relationships. One of the things I have leaned on in life is the church and what it's given me. I, I, lean, I lean on the prayers the church gives to me. When I don't know what else to say, when I don't have words, I have words, old ancient words from the church. I have Wesley's covenant prayers being within that Methodist tradition that hangs on my wall. I'm no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to come up with those words. But they've always spoken to me. It's from the institution of the church. At night, when things are weighing heavy on me, I lean on that prayer the church has taught me and my mother taught me to make it a habit. And she, and she got it from the church. She got it from the Lutheran church. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That one. Sometimes, when I walk into a room of a dying person, I'll be honest pastorally. I'm not sure what to say. I don't know what to do. The situation is tragic. And so what do I do? I go back to the psalmist who have been saying these words and giving help for people like me and you for thousands of years. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He made me lie down in green pastures. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. I couldn't come up with that on my own. It's part of the institution, it's part of the church, and it speaks for me when I am not all that spiritual. It's true. I'm not always that spiritual. Sometimes I just can't muster up the feelings for God. I'm tired or I'm irritated and I'm human. So I, I let the traditions, the ancient traditions of the church do it for me. That's why I say I'm not necessarily spiritual, but I am religious. Truthfully, there are have been Sunday mornings throughout these years as being a pastor when I wake up and I think, hmm, maybe I should call him sick. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm praying for a snowstorm in July. <laughs> but then I show up and we sing together. At the passage of the peace, someone reaches out to me and it's sincere when they say they're happy to see me. We sing, we pray, then I find I'm where I should be. It really is religion that has saved me. It's always there of the church, even when it's on a foul, waiting for me to acknowledge it. Yeah. The parable of the sower is a Jesus teaching that's been with me for many years, so I've had plenty of time to think about it and run it through. And that explanation that Jesus gives, I still don't get it. I don't understand a lot of it. But the farmer, she's generous with her seeds. She's tossing those seeds everywhere, on the path, on rocky ground, in the briar patch, and in dark, rich soil. And for the longest time, I interpreted this parable in a somewhat judgmental way, as to say, well, there are those of us who were thrown in the briar patch and never got anywhere with our faith. We just got choked up by worries of the world. Or oh, there are those of us who just really never went deep and we went on that you know, thin soil and never really rooted. Yeah. But a more honest interpretation, interpretation is that We've been all these seeds on this different terrains, depending upon the chapter of our lives. These grounds, these 
this different earths that the seas are falling on are the life trains, our trains. There are days when we have fallen on walking ground or in the briar patch. Amen? Amen. And we might be on that, in that briar patch because of poor choices we've made or simply by circumstances that we find ourselves in. It's, it's where we find ourselves after a divorce or when we've been laid off from our job or when a partner's died or when we have to admit we have an addiction. And we're not feeling all that spiritual. Been there. We need religion, the institution, when zeal has failed us, right? When we just aren't feeling it and can't make it happen. It's like saying, when you can't pray, just pray the prayers you're taught and know. Pray the prayers you were taught, and then don't worry about it. Just do it. Because in the end, it matters more what you do than what you feel. Feelings, that spirituality we always have talked about, that comes and goes, folks. But to be religious means to take the practice and spiritual and rituals that the church has given us and do them anyway, right? It's become common knowledge that attendance and membership in churches has been slipping. Everybody knows that. The numbers are clear. But there's also another interesting trend, and that's orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is on the rise, especially among millennials and Gen X, especially among kids who have now grown whose parents didn't take them to church and want that. And by orthodoxy, I mean a form of institutional religion that many of us really, especially in our realm, would consider rigid or formulaic, like there's a formula. Religious orthodoxy sometimes entails praying at certain times of the day or abstaining from uh, certain foods. It invades the details of our lives, like eating kosher. Within Catholicism, it would be, you know, attending the confessional regularly and praying the rosary. Early Methodists also had their forms of orthodoxy. We called it spiritual disciplines. You can just take it from the names, those things you just had to do. You just did them. Like if you were a Methodist in that early years, you were part of a covenant group, a small group that checked on the state of your soul. If you weren't part of that covenant group, you weren't part of the Methodist movement. It was just what you did. And you also gave time to being Methodist in our heritage, helping the poor. You took communion regularly. That was all part of it. And by doing this, it puts the believer in the context of practicing their belief, any, even when they don't feel like it anymore. And that gets you there. Even when you don't feel spiritual. If you just do it when you feel spiritual, well then, every now and then. And that doesn't shape us. These rituals and these habits actually carry us forward. Practice, folks, is what creates faith. Do you get what I'm saying there? Practice is what creates faith. If I sit in a couch all day and watch CSI episodes, I'm not going to be any closer to God, right? If that's not going to conjure up, oh, I feel spiritual now, he got caught. No, feeding and tending to the poor creates love of neighbor and God even when I don't feel like it. It doesn't matter whether or not I'm in the mood. I just do it anyway because that's what's commanded. That's orthodoxy. And now orthodoxy has some downsides to it, which is a whole other sermon I can't get into. But its purpose is to create that rich soil in our lives. When we're on rocky ground, I like this when a, um, a woman who's um, a part of that Christian orthodoxy movement in Catholicism said. She writes, When I first came to the faith, I felt as though I always had to work myself up to that moral pitch of enthusiasm. And she said, that was just unsustainable. I had to have um, this, this religious, this, this idea that I had to have this religious sentiment was exhausting. But the commandment to love God 
is about will, not affections. In other words, sometimes you just dutifully do what needs to get done and you let that practice carry you through. It, it, it's much like the fellow that I knew that was always asking me how I was doing. And if I just said, I'm fine, I was mildly berated because I didn't say I was great. And his question mildly irritated me. I didn't like it. Because I don't like the idea, and maybe you don't, of always having to feel great. Because that's kind of manic. That's not even life. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's some of what I'm saying here. There are times in our faith where, folks, it's okay to just go through the motions. That's fine. That's better. It's going to get you a lot further on than staying in bed with the covers over your head. And that's why I'm religious. Because it requires that I show up. Feeling spiritually good, that doesn't always happen for me. Angela Duckworth is a psychologist and she teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's been researching for years what makes for high achievers. But the part of the interview that I found most interesting was when she talked about passion. And I so agree with this. I know a lot of this is just my opinions, but you know. Take it for what you will. You want to argue with me after this. That'd be great. I'd enjoy that. <laughs> she was walking with this young kid in the neighborhood who was trying to, he's trying to like, find out what he's supposed to do with his life. And he said, now your advice for me would be to follow my passion. And she actually said, you know that word passion? I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. Because if you tell people who have a passion, you don't have to tell people who have a passion not to get up in the morning, early in the morning, do whatever it is they have a passion for. They're going to do it anyway, even if you told them not to do it. And that's a tiny group of people. They kind of figured it out. But then there's the rest of us who wake up in the morning and we don't have a whole lot of passion for much of anything. Right? I get it. Okay, it's like saying, okay, God, at the moment, I don't feel like diving in and loving you and my neighbor. I don't even feel like forgiving so-and-so. I just want to eat cake and watch Netflix movies. <laughs> but because it's a commandment, and I'm told to do it, I at least have to, in action, carry through on it and forgive that person, even if I don't feel like it, because the doing it, the orthodoxy, the practice, what the religion teaches me, it gets me there, finally. You see the difference there? During my teenage years and in college, I swam competitively. And I swam a lot. I mean, I think of all the years I have been in the water. It's kind of like odd, but there I was. And I was a distance swimmer, which meant that when the sprinters well, they were taking showers and getting going home while I was still, you know, going back and forth, back and forth. And there were these practices in college where you got up before the sun rose, before your classes, and then you did it again in the afternoon. And I'll tell you, I wasn't always passionate about it. You, you know, think about it. It's cold outside. You're putting your bathing suit on. You're going in cold water. And the coach is yelling at you about your left elbow is not high enough, and then the entry of your hand isn't good enough. And so you're doing that over and over and over again to get down the stroke. It's mundane. And there's not a lot of you know, excitement at times. But why do you do it? Well, you do it, I don't know, why do you do it? You do it because you're committed to the school. You also do it because they're giving you some money. But you do it because you're committed to the team. And you're committed to yourself, to improving, to, to getting, or getting your name on the board. You do it just because you said you do it. It's your commitment. And I know that word commitment is like, I don't want that commitment. <laughs> but that is kind of how religion is. If you just spot my spirituality, I'm not always going to get in that one. But what the church has commanded and Jesus has taught me is sometimes you just got to dive in. Even when you don't feel like it, show up. 
in spite of yourself. Yeah, so that's why I'm, your pastor is not necessarily spiritual. <laughs> that's okay. So that's that way too. <laughs> but dang, um, I am religious. <laughs>